Welcome to the LSE for this online event hosted by the Department of Social Policy and the Department of Economic History. My name is Lucinda Platt and I'm Professor of Social Policy here at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm really delighted to welcome today Professor Claudia Goldin, Professor Jane Humphreys, Dr. Berka Erjan and Dr. Eva Taseva to the LSE. Claudia Goldin is a Henry Lee Professor of Economics at Harvard University and she is a co-director of the MBER's Gender in the Economy Study Group. An economic historian and a labor economist, Claudia's research covers a wide range of topics, including the female labor force, the gender gap in earnings, income inequality, technological change, education and immigration. Jane Humphreys is Centennial Professor of Economic History at the LSE and a fellow of All Souls College, Oxford. Her research interests focus on labour markets, industrialisation, and the links between the family and the economy. Berkai Erjan is Associate Professor of Social Policy at the LSE. Berkai is a social demographer working at the intersection between family processes such as divorce, marriage, and fertility, and child and economic outcomes, savings, labour supply, and so on, to understand social stratification processes. And finally, Eva Taseva is an LSE Fellow in the Department of Social Policy. Eva's research focuses on income inequality and poverty and the redistributive, redistributive effects of tax benefit policies within specific countries and in cross-country comparative perspective. The event today will take the form of an open discussion to discuss the themes of gender equity and couple equity as presented in Claudia Goldin's book, Career and Family, Women's Long Journey Towards Equity. Now you can see the book, great book. Professor Goldin will start by outlining some of the key themes in her book. Then she'll be followed by commentaries from Professor Humphreys, Dr. Deseva and Dr. Urshan. And they will raise some questions um, and then it will be your turn to raise questions after that. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE gender equity. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. As I said, um, at the end, there will be the chance for you to put your questions to all of the speakers at the event today. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted to me and I will pose as many as I can get through to the speakers. Please let us know your name and affiliation and we're particularly keen to hear from our students and alumni. Um, so please identify yourself as a student or alumni if you are. But now, I'm, without more ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Claudia Goldin to talk about uh, career and family. Thank you. Thanks very much. I will share my screen. Just make certain that it goes, yeah, that's fine. So Lucinda, everything worked? Everything's fine? Okay. One always yes. to... Please carry on, it's all looking good. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. So uh, thank you all for being here today. It's a special day in America. It's our Thanksgiving. And um, I am very, very pleased to be here with you to see so many friendly faces uh, on the panel. So my book traverses 120 years from a time when college graduate women were able to have either a family or a career to right now when many women anticipate having both a family and a career, when more women than men uh, in many countries are graduating college and when women and men uh, in the US at least are achieving advanced and professional degrees to the same extent. But while there's great similarity in ambitions, there's somewhat less, unfortunately, in eventual achievements. And the reason largely concerns the concept of greedy work and the relationship between gender inequality and couple inequity, or the opposite between gender equality and couple equity. So these are the two sides of the same issue for heterosexual couples. 
same-sex couples can have couple inequity, but that doesn't give rise to gender inequality. So when heterosexual couples give up couple equity, they increase gender inequality both within the couple and within the economy, the nation uh, as a whole. And I'll explain that. A few clarifications to begin with. My work concerns college graduate women and men because they have had the greatest opportunity to achieve what I call career, even when their numbers were very low. And the second thing is that career really is different from a job. A career is something achieved over time, and it comes from the Latin root to mean to run a race, as in chariot and carriage. And a job is more of a spot position to earn a living. So aspirations and achievements of college women across the past 120 years or so really greatly changed. And the reasons for the changes vary with the period. So there was a transition from brawn work to brain work, for example. There were huge changes within the home. And somewhat later, there was greatly improved ability of women to control their fertility and then enabled a delay in marriage, a delay in childbearing. But the way that work is structured and the persistence of various social norms, no matter how much weaker they've become, mean that women are less able to attain both career and family. So the groups of college graduate women that I describe in the book form what I call a succession of generations, each sort of metaphorically passing a baton from one to the next with its warnings and its advice. So there are five distinct groups that can be discerned. And the first graduated college at the beginning of the 20th century, it achieved career or family, rarely both. The next had a job and then a family. The third had a family and then a job. Those are the mothers of the baby boom in America. The fourth, my generation, was the first to desire a career and a family, but did it as career, then family. And the fifth, the one that uh, is the uh, uh, closest to the present, desires a career and a family and has succeeded, we'll see, to some degree. The 120 year transition from career or family to career and family is shown here bookended with women who served in the US Congress beginning with Jeanette Rankin, the first woman elected to US federal office. She was very typical of the career portion, not a typical person of her cohort. She had no kids, no marriage, but she had an incredibly amazing career. At the other extreme is Tammy Duckworth, senator from the state of Illinois. Uh, she is the first senator to have a baby while holding office. She is also a, a decorated veteran, uh, a decorated and disabled veteran. She is the first to bring a baby into an active session of Congress, although there are many in America who would say that there were always babies in Congress. She is an extraordinary member of group five. And in the middle is the famous Betty Friedan looking a little coquettish. I'm gonna provide a little more detail on these. And I'll tell you something about the fraction who were never married at various ages, the fraction who didn't have children by the age of 45 and the fractions who worked if they were ever married at various ages. So beginning with group one, college graduate women first attained career or family. Few in this group, as you see, manage both. 50% of this group never had a birth or never adopted. About a third never married. Just a small fraction though were in the labor force if they were ever married. In group two, more college women began to aspire to have careers but that didn't happen for a number of reasons. In group three, job opportunities improved. America was swept up in the post-war baby boom, early marriages, lots of kids. 
college women shifted to planning for family first, but then a job. Just 9% of this group never married. You can see the extraordinary change from the first group. And about 18% never had a birth or never adopted. Uh, of those who married, over 90% had kids. Their employment was low when they were young. It greatly increased to almost three quarters when the kids were older. This really was progressive change since they found a way <clears throat> to have a job and then a family, uh, to have a job and a family. The order was family and then job. For group four, career then family became the goal for many. They delayed marriage and children for career. They had very high work rates when they were young. The pill and its dissemination to young single women enabled the delay of marriage and family and help boost their investments in career. But the biological clock ran out on many. As you can see, 27% never had kids as this iconic Lichtenstein print reminds us. For group five, having seen what group four did, their goal is have both. And in fact, they achieved some, something better in the sense that 21% didn't have a kid by the time they were in their 40s. Marriage and family for group five are still being greatly, greatly delayed, but birth rates are actually up, partly due to assisted reproductive technologies. Of course, there is also the fact that we've had a pandemic. And if we look at this group, in the, uh, in the near future, we might see this going in the slightly other direction. You may be thinking that because of the large increase in college graduation rates, that most of these differences across these groups concerns selection into college. But the surprising finding is that selection really isn't that important. The elite changed along with the hoi polloi. Now, an important accompaniment to the transition across these groups as changes in customs and norms. Something called the General Social Survey has for some time asked respondents whether they believed, and the question has remained the same, children would likely suffer if their mothers worked. And the answers here are graphed so that the horizontal axis is the respondent's birth year, the vertical axis is the fraction agreeing with that statement. And as can be seen, the agreement decreased for both men and women. Without any real new evidence about this, the response changed and fewer agreed with the notion that children would be harmed. The older norm, in fact, became more expensive to sustain as the earnings of women increased. But even though a succession of women has made progress on the journey to career and family, women's careers still often take a back seat to those of their spouses. Even among those in the latest group, I'll call that group five plus, graduating college in the early 2000s, we can track them to the time they're in their late 30s. 27% have achieved career and family by that time. That is way up from what it was in the earlier groups, but 45% of, equiv of equivalent men have. So that's about 60% of what men have done. The most recent group has expressed frustration and has placed the blame on many different things, such as discrimination, managerial bias, pay inequity, sexual harassment, and to measure their level of discontent, I've used counts of phrases about gender discrimination and sex discrimination in newspapers. And here are the counts based on the New York Times. So you can see that there are two waves. The first in the 1970s, and you can see that here uh, we see Betty Free Dan in the noisy revolution of 50 years ago, and the second more recently. But as each group progressed and passed the baton one to the next, and as actual barriers fell and social norms changed, the real underlying problem was revealed. 
There's no question that there is classic discrimination and bad actors and biased workers and lots of other bad things. But most of the difference in earnings and promotions and the ability to have career and family is due to something else. And the new problem with no name, to paraphrase Betty Friedan, is the notion of greedy work. Working more hours or particular hours leads to greater rewards even on an hourly basis. In up or out jobs, more effort today produces perhaps, hopefully, the promotion later. But to have a family takes time, and it takes the time of at least one parent. There is no way to fully contract that out. And why would one want to do that? For a couple to share the joys equally is costly. So let me illustrate. We have two jobs here. The horizontal axis is number of hours and the vertical axis is total earnings. So one job, the flexible job is the red line and it has a linear wage with respect to hours. And the other job is the not so flexible job and it's the blue line, and it has a wage or a slope that rises with hours. <clears throat> a couple with children can't both work at the blue dot. If they did, the kids would perish, but they could both work at the red dot. But if they did, they would be leaving a lot of money on the table. And that's the difference that's marked between the dots. So one works the flexible job, the less remunerative red job, and the other works, the blue job, the less flexible and more remunerative blue job. Now, for many highly educated couples with children, she's a professional who's also on call at home, and he's a professional who's also on call at the office. In consequence, he generally earns more than she does, in this case, a lot more. And that gives rise to a gender gap in earnings, and it also produces couple inequity. If the flexible job could be made more productive, as it is here, the difference, as you can see here, is less, and family equity would be purchased at a much lower cost. Note that even for same-sex couples, there could still be couple inequity, but it wouldn't add to gender inequality. And even if the couple wanted a 50-50 relationship, high earnings for a position with the less controllable hours would entice them to specialize. Both would have jobs, but one would have the less remunerative, flexible position and the other would have the higher paying, more demanding position. They might even both be considered to be careers. The point is that the gender gap in earnings is a symptom of career blockage. The cause of career blockage here is the high price of couple equity. So let me get into a couple of solutions and finish up. So what are some solutions? Well, the first thing is getting the correct diagnosis to any problem is the first step. And I see three possible solutions. Two would involve changing relative prices, and one would try, although somewhat difficult, to shift preferences. The first would involve lowering the cost of flexibility, which is the amenity here. Another would involve reducing the cost of childcare and elder care. And the third would try to alter gender norms through possibly incentives. Let's take a deeper look at the first solution. How does one lower the price of flexibility? The simplest way is to create good substitutes between workers. IT could be used to pass information and hand off clients with little loss of information and with great fidelity. Teams of substitutes could be created as they have been in areas like pediatrics and anesthesiology and veterinary medicine and personal banking 
and many tech jobs and primary care doctors. Teams of compliments, by the way, as is often the case in consulting, actually increase the cost of coordinating schedules. So teams of substitutes, not teams of compliments. Now, the tale that I have told was set in an era that I call BCE. And what I mean by that is before the COVID era. What does it tell us about the new era? So in mid-March 2020, we descended into an era I call DC during COVID. Those who could sheltered in place. Those who could worked from home. Fortunate children had online schooling and at-home help. Parental child care doubled. In the age that we're in now, which I call ACDC, which is after COVID, but also unfortunately during COVID, schools are open by and large, but child care time is still somewhat higher than before. One edge of a silver lining to these very dark times is that in the US at least, we have finally begun a national dialogue about caregiving. We had this conversation before, 77 years before the dark moment started. In 1943, when we desperately needed non-working mothers to help on the home front to win the war, we created subsidized preschools open from early morning to evening Women are now about half of the US labor force. The US economy runs on women. Another edge to the silver lining is that we have learned to use technology to work from home. And as long as it doesn't become a female enclave, it, we, it will serve to lower the cost of flexibility. We've always had flexible jobs but they were expensive. If one doesn't have to go to Tokyo to do that M&A, parents, especially women, will be able to take those generally lucrative positions. Another part of the solution, therefore, is to reduce extensive travel and meetings and enable WFH but don't create a WFH enclave and do not create work from hell. Make the amenity less expensive to workers by making flexible work more productive. The story I have told is for the BCE world, but it's precisely what we need now in the ACDC world. So prior to March of 2020, in a time I have called BCE, the reasons women were being held back from achieving career and family became clearer and clouds parted and allowed us to see what was blocking the way. And what was blocking the way was greedy work and the relationship between gender inequality and couple inequity or between gender equality and couple equity, the two sides of the same issue. When couples give up couple equity, they increase gender inequality. The journey continues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, that was fantastic. Um, so I'm going to hand straight over to Professor Humphreys, who's now going to provide some comments or, or questions. To that. And is going to share her screen as well. I think we've just got some slides here. Are you okay? Do you want to do you want to unmute as well, Jane? So you're still muted.
Do we have the slides anywhere else that could help? Yes. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's great. Yes, yes. Um, can you see the slides? No. Oh. Mm. Try again. We saw them perfectly before, so let's hope. That's 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 it now. Yes. Thank you. So I'm very sorry. This is taking some time. Okay. Um, so now it just needs to go into. Um, yes. The. From beginning. Um, no, I think. Can no, you hear me? No, it's brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, that's great. Yes, if you can. Brilliant. That's perfect. Wonderful. We're there. So over to you now, Jane. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Well, it's it's an honour and a pleasure to comment on Claudia Goldin's fine book. Um, as an economic historian, I particularly welcome the historical framing of, of um, career and family, which takes us chronologically through the varying responses of cohorts of women to the difficulties faced in balancing the demands of work and family. I also enjoyed the way in which the different cohorts were represented by the real life stories of, 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 of um, individual women. Um, though the book and its appendices clearly direct interested readers to um, the, the underlying studies that really base this book, many of which have done, been done by Professor Golden herself. Um, these stories got me thinking about the women that I knew and I, I had um, um, been taught by, um, looked up to, um, and how they had negotiated the, the difficulties of family and, and career, um, sometimes at great cost um, to themselves. Um, I'm thinking here of Phyllis Dean, um, of um, very many other women that I have known professionally. Um, but most of all, I am enthusiastic about the bringing together of family and labor markets to understand women's changing experience and ongoing inequalities especially as the former, the family is usually remains a black box um, detached from the labor market in economic analysis. And I think this is going to be my theme tonight. And so I'm gonna actually talk less about the historical framing of the book than about its current implications. I could use my whole 10 minutes to praise this book, um, but as a commentator, I think my job is, is to press. And so I'm going to press on two particular issues. And the two issues that I'm, I'm um, concerned with here are, um, first of all, causation, how we think about the causation of the gender pay gap, because I think that's actually quite important. And it's importance, and by here I mean really it's relevance, it's relevance to all women. So I'm stepping beyond the college educated women that are the actual um, focus of um, Claudia's book. And the discussion of causation promotes issues around, can we change the way we work? And I think the discussion of relevance poses issues about, can we revalue caring? And I would argue that both these issues come up against um, the economics discipline itself and its market focus. And that will be um, really my the, the, the direction my comments are going in. So um, causation and the gender pay gap. Well, of course, as social scientists, we all know the difficulties of making sure we never interpret associations as causes and identifying causal processes in the world of simultaneity and feedback effects is extremely difficult. Um, we used to rather blithely, rather um, indiscriminately rely on econometric analyses of the gender pay gap to identify causation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, more recently, I think economists and economic historians have been backing off causal claims generally or um, really pursuing the nature of causality rather more carefully within econometrics. Um, uh, and you see this by in, in the gender pay gap literature by people 
stopping really talking about causes and talking about sources or drivers of the gender gap. Um, but I want to drill down a little bit further and say what lies behind these drivers. And I would argue that bias, alongside inequality within the home, lurks behind many drivers. But associations can be still read as causes by reference to the market, some kind of disembodied um, fixer of the value of individuals' work. And I would argue that this privileging of market mechanisms with little sensitivity to the importance of social reproduction reflects the market-driven economics paradigm um, that we face. An example here, my illustration, is an econometric decomposition of the gender pay gap. Um, I've chosen, a, it's representative of very many studies. It's a very recent study by Vanessa Gash and some co-authors, um, uses uh, household level data. And um, it, it um, basically decomposes the gender pay gap using a kind of shift share analysis. So it, it finds out the, the general drivers or sources or causes of the gap by doing this statistical decomposition of what lies behind the differences in male and female pay. This is called a Oaxaca blinder decomposition. Um, and not surprisingly, Gash um, and her co-authors find the same general drivers behind the gender pay gap. These are occupational segregation, the fact that men and women work in different sectors of the economy, and they work in different types of firms. Generally, women work in smaller firms. Um, they also find that um, the history of workers, the labor market attachment of male and female workers is different. And that too is associated with a large chunk of the gender pay gap. And the residual, um, we used to call it the unexplained residual, um, is really all that's left to um, be thought of as discrimination. And um, Claudia herself discusses some of these kinds of studies. Um, for instance, she, she looks at the effects of, of occupational segregation, um, at, at call, calling these, these kinds of decompositions a kind of a, a, um, a, a mind exercise where you move people around um, virtually within your within your mind to to try and identify what effect it would have if women and men worked in in, in identical um, job, jobs for example so let me say first of all here then that the occupational segregation does is associated with a, a significant part of the gender pay gap and this then is thought of as reflecting women's choices but as in fact, the book really carefully points out, and um, there's many things going to women's choices. Is it, in fact, something to do with cultural distinctions uh, about what is a suitable profession for a woman or a suitable job for a woman? Or is it a search for anticipated flexi flexibility that women look forward to the kinds of work that they think they might well be able to more easily combine with family. So there's a feedback effect here. Um, but in the end, the argument is, well, the market really, you pay a price and the productivity of women in these, the productivity of women in the jobs and the firms they choose is reduced. Um, but, I would also suggest that perhaps there's scope here for thinking about the devaluation of women's work, um, the systematic cultural devaluation of women's work that might actually feed back into these market valuations that are not, in fact, um, completely removed from their cultural and social context. But what I really want to talk about is the labor market attachment and the history of individual workers because, of course, this links in very clearly with Professor Goldin's long run story and her the culmination of her story in greedy work um, and whether or not men and women 
can devote themselves to a, a greedy, a greedy labor um, force demand um, and be on call even um, when at home. So here the argument is that choices, again, greedy workforces couple specialization. It's a kind of choiceless choice um, that women face here. Um, and we also hear arguments that this is a return to experience. And furthermore, of course, that labor market history signals commitment. So these are factors that underlie productivity. And again, we're back at how the market values women's work. Logic. And I want to think a little bit here about the penalties that you face when you don't have a continuous work history. And there was a paper in the Monthly Labor Review in, I think, the 19, well, it was in the 1980s, and I couldn't find any update of this study. It was by Larry Levin and Joyce Jacobson, and they looked at the effects of gaps in women's work histories in a longitudinal analysis of women's pay. These gaps were often of short duration, as Claudia, uh, as Claudia notes in the book. And the return of women to the labor market is, is, uh, signals an immediate catch-up effect, but that catch-up is never completed. 20 years later, women are still paying a penalty for a gap that they had many, many decades earlier. Is this reasonable? Is such a penalty um, really logically um, acceptable? Can, can you actually believe that this somehow there's been a decline in human capital um, or um, that um, the, the loss of experience here was so important that it created a permanent penalty? I think also it's important to know men also gap. Um, they go off to travel or to study. Um, and um, if gaps reduce experience, we would, I'd like to see some study of men's gaps and the effects of, of those gaps on their pay. Um, it also seems bizarre to me that we can argue that gaps reduce experience and depreciate human capital for women just had an argument in this country about how a second job is really a vital experience to members of parliament, for example, and that it enlarges um, their competence in the political sphere if they have had some experience in other spheres. Plus, many women build on the experience that they would have had when they were gapping and raising children or looking after elder elders. I haven't really got time to go into the resistance to greedy work, but I actually think that much of this, much of these arguments really are a smokescreen. And I've been looking in job seekers' views here on this topic, and I've given you a quotation here from what one job seeker said about the response to their discontinuous work history. And essentially they say, it's just a smokescreen by employers. So moving on then from uh, this, this kind of argument, looking at the, the, um, the way economics looks at um, work histories, I want to now turn to the relevance or the importance of the gender pay gap. It's largest for high earners, we know that for college educated women, but that's because there's more scope if you earn at the top end of the distribution for there to be a gap between men and women. And college educated women represent a large and increasing proportion of the labor force. Uh, women now, in fact, are more than 50% of college graduates in this country. Um, the gender pay gap is of much less relevance to women in other segments of the labor market. Um, again, the GASH study, for instance, found that for poorer women, the gender pay gap was only 4%. Um, it was does this then mean that working poor have little to gain from gender equalization? Well, I would argue not, and I would uh, suggest that this leads us back into thinking about the importance of caring within the family, because the unpaid care work that falls on women 
perhaps disproportionately on poorer women, um, this is shared. This is something that brings college educated women and other women in the labor force. Um, it, they share this unpaid um, care uh, burden. But poorer women, in fact, face not greedy work, but what I like to call bulimic work. This is zero hours contracts, irregular shifts, uh, women in jobs where they can be called upon to work long hours at short notice. Um, and this then intensifies um, the nature of the care that they need. They need wraparound care. They need care to cover for their shift work, which is really impossible. Certainly impossible to get at the prices these women can pay um, in the United Kingdom. And many of these women, of course, have relied on informal care, typically provided by other family members, especially by grandparents. Um, according to Age UK in 2017, the unpaid caring work, mainly childcare, done by grandparents was worth £3.9 billion pounds per annum in the UK. Uh, hey. I suppose to interrupt you, but I'm aware, a little aware of the time. Is there yes, a... I, I'm almost finished. I'm almost through, so, yeah. um, so, but valuing caring work, of course, also then raises questions with market valuations. So I'm arguing in, in conclusion that the pandemic shares out misery amongst women. It's give, widened the gender pay gap um, for all of the very highest earners. Um, women are more likely to lose their jobs. They're more likely to be put on furlough. Um, they're more likely to be left struggling with care and education. All of this is well known. Uh, let me refer you to a special issue of feminist economics in, in, in the last year, a really good special issue edited by Naila Kabir and Shahaz Razivi and um, Yana Rogers. Um, the ONS urges us to think about these numbers in long run context, but given the way, and this is really uh, one of the important thrusts of Claudia's book, the way in which work histories pursue women and any evidence of prioritizing when women counts against them is likely to cause lasting harm to women's careers. So we can search as, as much as we want for silver linings in the pandemic. We can say, well, it might accelerate a flexibilization, but for many women, that just means bulimic work. A silver lining too might be working from home promotes more equal sharing, but the Institute of Education survey um, really provide difficult, um, ambiguous empirical evidence on that. And the silver lining also is that it might be that, that they, we the pandemic has highlighted um, the importance of care. <laughs> so as, as revaluing caring work, I'm inclined to, to quote <laughs> Greta here, it's blah, blah, blah. Feminist economists have been arguing for this for decades, that we need to put more value into our caring labor. Um, and um, a care-led recovery, as Himmel White um, and Dehane point out, in, Dehane will point out in the feminist economic special issue, could create more jobs than const a construction-led one. And B, um, probably uh, what we really need here is care to be seen as a big infrastructural inv investment um, and to, to, to try and promote a care-led recovery from the COVID pandemic. And that will be a, a, a useful legacy and a silver lining. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Lots of challenges there. I'm going to move straight on to um, Dr. DeSeva um, now to give her take um on the book so over to you i think you also have some slides to share yeah thanks very much uh let me just i get the message that i cannot share the screen let me try again yeah now it should work yes can see that yes that's great great uh, thanks very much. I just have a few comments uh, on the book. I think some of these things already, uh, I think, came up in the discussion, so I'll just try and quickly note them. So 
the book Career and Family starts with this very big question, why is there a gender pay gap? And this is a beautifully written book. It's also very, uh, a very scholarly book. It's hugely impressive and it traces the history of career and family for college educated women in the US since the 1900s. And it identifies what still troubles women's careers today. It does this by relying on rigorous statistical analysis and on many different data sets to trace women's choices in terms of career, marriage and childbearing. So the data uh, comes, comes, for example, from household surveys, women's biographies uh, or testimonies. And uh, as Professor Goldin already mentioned, um, so the book identifies kind of two main causes. Um, the first kind of key theme is about, I guess, gender discrimination and occupational segregation. And gender discrimination here is in this traditional um, sense, for example, women being paid less for doing the same work as men. And occupational segregation is this idea of women going into lower paid uh, occupations. But I think what may come as a surprise to some readers is that this is actually not um, um, the main cause for the gender pay gap. It's, uh, the book convincingly argues it can only explain around a third. So two thirds are due to something else. So this is not the main theme of the book. The main theme is that the problems are much more complicated. Uh, and in particular, uh, the issue is uh, about job design and structure and uh, the role of greedy work. So these increasing returns to doing longer inflexible hours. So labor markets generously rewarding the person who is willing to hold um, a greedy job. And uh, yeah, in the case of couples, if there are caring responsibilities, both members of the couple can take the greedy job one member has to be on call and home and that usually tends to be the woman while the man takes up the greedy job and the book also mentions that uh, the value of greedy work has soared since the 1980s so there are two main ideas or contributions that i particularly liked so the the first one um is kind of this uh, idea or lesson for both social scientists and policymakers which cannot be emphasized enough and that is that to understand today's problems we need to look at the past so the book uh, examines how the concept of career and family has evolved over the past hundred plus years and it takes us on a journey to follow the experiences and choices of these five distinct groups of women which have been born in different parts over the last century and the second idea or key contribution is this concept of greedy work. Um, again, it's not about discrimination, which are perhaps kind of traditional um, ideas about the gender pay gap, but the, this huge premium, but it's about the huge premium on the ability to work a lot and be constantly on call in the office. So the key implication is to make jobs more substitutable and flexible, um, we need that to reduce gender inequality and couple inequity. So I have four points that I would like to um, kind of raise for discussion. The first point is about solutions. So the book offers a hugely impressive analysis of the problem. Um, but I felt that perhaps it's a bit reluctant uh, to propose solutions. And as Professor Goldin also notes in the book, there are no quick fixes uh, to the problem. But my first question is, why do greedy jobs exist at all? Uh, so it seems that it's very good for employers to have substitutable workers because then they don't need to pay this high premium for the longer inflexible hours. But the fact that this is not happening across all occupations. The fact that there are greedy jobs maybe suggests that there are substantial costs for substitutability. For example, it's very costly for employers to have two workers doing the same jobs, uh, doing the same job rather than one. Maybe there are also substantial coordination costs or costs in terms of who should be held accountable if something goes wrong. So my question is, does this mean that the problem is unlikely to go away by itself? And related to that, how can workers, women, men, governments push firms to be less greedy 
if that doesn't happen by default? And will we have to just live with some greedy jobs? Uh, so especially in markets where the winner takes it all, jobs tend to be non-substitutable. For example, if we think about writers or performers, professors or athletes, so we can have one Claudia Golding, but we can't have two. And I just want to also highlight, um, as previously noted, this the important role for social norms here. So the fact that it is men who tend to take the greedy jobs while women stay on call at home. Uh, so how can we actually change uh, these norms? So if we have to live with greedy jobs, how can we kind of make sure that it is sometimes the woman who takes the greedy job? So that means that we still have couple inequity, but we can close the gender inequality. And I also want to kind of put out there that though um, discrimination or occupational segregation is, are not the main culprit for the gender pay gap, there may be still a lot to do to tackle this and the analysis in the book is US focused, but discrimination may be more important in other settings. The second point uh, I want to raise is um, uh, also about the pandemic's silver lining. Um, so the book um, talks about the extra flexibility that we've gained during the pandemic. So before you had to take a flight to go to Tokyo, to strike a deal, to make a handshake. Now handshakes can be made online. So in other words, the cost of flexibility has been pushed down. So presumably there is, well, potentially there is less need for specialization within the couple. But as the book also, uh, mentions data from the US, and by the way, that's consistent also with data from the UK and other countries. So these data show that it's women who have borne the bigger brunt of care responsibilities during the pandemic. So there is, we have gained in terms of extra uh, flexibility, but it seems men are <laughs> grabbing that extra flexibility. So it's not being shared equally within the couple. So my question to uh, Professor Goldin is, how do these fit with your optimism for the future? Uh, and what your thoughts are on how will the pandemic affect the long-term careers of women? And again, I just want to highlight again that social norms seem to be playing an important role during the pandemic. The fact that it's women who continue to care the bigger brunt uh, of caring responsibilities. The next point um, I want to raise is about trying to understand what has um, contributed to uh, the value of greedy jobs soaring since the 1980s. And um, so what has happened in the US and by the way also in the UK since the 1980s is that top income tax rates have fallen substantially. And at the same time, top income shares have increased dramatically. Uh, and researchers have argued that cuts to top income tax rates have led to changes to the bargaining power of workers and greater individualization of pay. And that has thereby led to increased remuneration at the top. So my question is whether uh, these cuts to top income tax rates have contributed to the increase in the value of uh, greedy jobs. And, potentially what are the policy implications of that. And my the last point I want to raise is about whether um, the menopause is continuing to hold back women's uh, careers and pay um, in older age. And here I put menopause in quotation marks because that could mean that that could be about the symptoms of menopause, but also it could be about perceived or actual negative attitudes by colleagues and employers uh, toward all the menopausal women, which may be affecting their careers and pay. Um, and these are just two snapshots from recent articles in The Guardian. This one is about an ongoing study with the ambitious goal to uncover the impact of menopause on senior women in the city. Um, and perhaps it, it, this is a concern that employers, at least maybe in the UK, are kind of increasingly recognizing. Um, the LSC, for example, recently published a menopause toolkit with some guidance for managers. And one of the uh, guidelines, very fitting uh, with our discussions of tonight, 
is to actually consider offering flexibility <laughs> to affected uh, workers. So this is all. Thanks very much. Um, it was really a pleasure reading the book. Uh, I've learned a lot and I definitely recommend everybody to read Career and Family. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great comments and, uh, and yeah, again, lots of, lots of questions and challenges there. Um, so now over to you, um, uh, Dr. Ojan, and I don't think you do have any slides. No, I don't have any slides and I apologize for not having any slides. I'm a bit starstruck here because Professor Golden's work has been extremely influential on my dissertation and through my uh, through my career because I wrote, wrote a lot about the uh, female labor supply. And I'm trained as an economist, but then work in the family demography area. But, but Kai, are you speaking directly into the microphone? It's a little I bit am. Busy. So is it better here now if I speak or if I bring the camera? Yes. That's my great. microphone is in the camera. Is it better now? So I was just saying that it's a great honor and pleasure to discuss this book with um, by Professor Golden, whose work has influenced my work a lot. So I'm a bit starstruck here and my camera is not helping. <laughs> so as a social demographer, um, I have, um, what I have taken from this book is like, I was fascinated by the three elements where demographers do care a lot about it. One of them is cohort change, which was very clearly uh, displayed in the book. And the second part is basically two things that demographers studied a lot, age at marriage, age at first birth, and their consequences on women's careers in general. So the big part of the book is, could be summarized along these dimensions. And the rest of the book is about uh, flexible careers and greedy jobs and labor demand. There were two axes to discuss about the issues of work-life work balance, which was one side is basically that we have studied in the economics for a long time about the factors that are affecting labor supply and the greedy work framework um, makes us look more closer to the labor demand side and see what makes the jobs actually um, more greedy versus the others. But when we think about the demand side factors, there are a lot of other demand side factors. Technological change has been very much studied by the economists. And, and but in addition to the technological change, one of the aspects of the technological change is automation. And that is another undergoing development in the last uh, second half of the last decade, uh, in addition to COVID, uh, which has con like mixed effects on the women's um, demand for like women's labor demand. And um, so there is this end part of the book that talks about policy, policies and solutions, which I like quite a lot. And uh, the book is extremely rich in its um, providing examples, biographical information, and as well as quite nuanced in discussing the new literature that is looking at the college educated women's interruptions and first birth and, and, and combines a number of uh, post relevant issues about the parental uh, leave uh, father quotas and everything about the policy solutions too. So I enjoyed overall the book a lot and I recommend everyone uh, who's not familiar with the, um, Professor Golden's work. It's a very, very nice overview of her work and then the general uh, literature in the field. Uh, one, like I have a, like three major points to make about the uh, um, books that I was as a reader uh, interested to learn more about it. One of them is a, the, is a very clear explicit focus and well justified focus on the college educated women. Um, and uh, Professor Golden makes the case very clearly about the selection into college education does not drive these cohort changes that we see. And it's actually when we look at the sample of women who are in the elite colleges like Radcliffe and so on, uh, the, the selection um, is not the, the, the explanation, the preferences are quite constant. But we know that the preferences on the college education group that are non-elite, and when the heterogeneity in that group increases over time, might have driven the effect. And then that is kind of confirmed with the anecdotal, anecdotal evidence that the professor provides in the book about her own mother has changed their preferences or norms about the uh, whether childcare should be um, done by the mother or the, or, or the formal childcare. So I was a bit more interested in that part of the discussion because as a social demographer that we know that there's also a change in the norm around the childcare. Childcare language has changed and then People talk more about child investments and parental investments rather than just the care part of the uh, duty. And then there's a little discussion about the college educated women actually driving that language change and ideological change around parental investments, which is like they're, they're talking about parental ideologies, intensive parenting, which the requirements for raising children have gone up. And that revolution itself 
is driven also by the college educated woman, which is a very interesting revolution, which is very much untouched in the book because uh, like parental ideologies and changes around the parental investments are uh, implemented by the women whose opportunity cost is higher in the labor markets. They do more of the reading to the children. They do more of the taking children to the clubs. They do more of the uh, intensive parenting and long breastfeeding and all other, all other factors where the opportunity cost is higher for the sake of perhaps um, privileging the next generation and, and transmitting part of that, that college education privilege relative to the rest of the distribution in the next generation. So it's somehow foregoing the current generation some sort of labor supply and earnings cost in favor of the next generation children's advantage in the, like in the future. And that hasn't been much uh, elaborated in the book. And like, I would like to learn a bit more about what Professor Golden thinks about that development and what we think about childcare is not anymore the childcare itself, but it's actually an ideology around the parental investments. And um, another aspect that I would like to hear more about is this uh, greedy work notion. And, and that is a very much specific in the theoretical postulation is to the college educated women and the high end of the occupational distribution. And we have like, and the quotation in the book that says occupational segregation explains only one third of the uh, general earnings gap, but the occupational segregation's weight in the earnings gap is higher in the non-college education group, perhaps, right? So, um, is, so we, we, may, we, may, we may think about occupational segregation as a decomposition and the overall earn, like earnings gap might be still small, but in the, among the non-college education group, the occupational segregation still carries a higher rate, uh, more than 50% in the recent estimations uh, that explains the differences in the, in the earnings gap in the rest of the group. So should we really think uh, less about occupational segregation and uh, think more about the uh, greedy work? And this brings me to the third factor, which is about self-employment. I am fascinated by Professor Golden's self-employment papers I've read original papers and in the and um, with Professor Cutts and on the uh, on the MBA uh, workers and as well as the pharmacists. I was particularly interested in self-employment myself. So there's this notion around the self-employment, which is uh, argued by a number of economists that they say it's one of the forms of work that women uses to ensure work and family life balances. This is not the case, of course, when you look at the credential self-employed, which are MBA owners or pharmacists and so on that require licensing and credentials, which require also long like education trajectories um, before they become self-employed. But for the rest of the self-employed population, uh, like we see on average, they have higher number of children, almost in most, most advanced economies than the equivalent wage employees. And even in the book, I was quite puzzled and surprised to see that professional self-employed women uh, like the surgeons was the example, end up on average having more children than their comparable uh, wage employees. And the explanation is because they have higher income to start with, that they could afford childcare and other, other things. And one of the reasons why people become self-employed to have control over their income resources, as we know from the literature, but also um, for alternative mobility patterns. And um, although self-employment has been at the same time portrayed in European literatures as one form of instable, uncertain job category. So like it's when, when we discuss why low, slow fertility has been observed a lot in, the, in Europe, especially in Southern Europe, one of the explanations have been coming from the macro studies is that like self-employment rates, unemployment rates, and they were all pulled together to, the, to say that um, like income uncertainty and labor market uncertainty have been increasing dramatically to, to then generates a very low fertility rates in Europe and, and which was um, self-employment in that case was portrayed as an insecure form of employment. And that was uh, the, the, the dimension of the occupations which is not discussed in the book, the, the insecurity and uncertainty part of the, part of the labor market. Finally, um, coming back to the um, occupational segregation or field segregation, um, like one of the questions that I was burning to ask uh, Professor Golden because I studied economics under my undergraduate and then my master's as well. And I'm, a, I'm trained as an economist then became a demographer. And when I was studying economics, um, studying gender within economics was 
quite an unusual thing that there was no one studying and then the only literature was produced about, like was a handful of leading scholars, including yourself, Professor Golden. So I was very much uh, fascinated by that work, but uh, you've been studying successfully women uh, within the field of economics discipline, which the discipline itself is coming to terms with its own inclusion problems these days in the, uh, as an economics um, science where academic economics is, is sufficiently inclusive to women or not. And um, during these self-inspection, I was uh, like wanting, wanting to ask whether you faced any difficulty yourself in your career studying women within the discipline of economics rather than say studying trade or macro or, or finance. Uh, I was wondering about that because within the economics of discipline, there is also a field segregation. And I was wondering whether it has any knock-on effect on the gender gap, gap within the discipline of e economics and whether we should care about that. So here I finish my questions and I really appreciate for getting this chance to ask my questions here and I'm very honored to read the book and thank you so much. Thank you. So, um, so yet, yet more questions. I want to, there are a lot of people who want to ask um, questions from the audience. So I'm uh, going to let them have their time and then maybe we'll get five minutes at the end where you might get the chance to pick up on some of these points as well, Claudia, if, that, if we can do it that way. So um, there are already quite a lot of questions in the, um, uh, in the Q and A. So I'm just going to um, uh, take them in, in order and try and get through as many as possible. So it'd be great if you could keep your responses um, uh, relatively short. People have been asked to um, identify who they're for, but um, not, all of, um, uh, not all of them have done so. So I'll start with them. Uh, the first one in front of me is uh, Debbie Fan who is an um, LSE master's student at LSE Department of Economic History. Um, and Debbie's asking, historically and culturally and currently in the US, there were or are institutional factors other than the cost of flexible jobs that induce gender inequality, such as anti-abortion laws or the failure of ERA. How do we view the relationship between the cost of flexibility and what else can we do to remove the institutional barriers to gender equality? So I think that's for big, you. Yeah, it's a big question. Thanks a lot. Um, uh, as I said at the end of my talk, the clouds have parted and now we can see the big issue. So, uh, so one can sort of look back in history and see an, barriers that were real walls, not just little hurdles. And those get reduced, and then we can see uh, what is really the major barrier today. That isn't to say that there isn't, you know, uh, bias and, and discrimination still sitting around, or sexual harassment, which we know is still sitting around, but they're far less than barriers such as marriage bars or anti nepotism bars or things like that. So thanks very much, Debbie. So I'll move straight on to the next question, um, which uh, comes from uh, Patrick Wallace in the Department of Economic History. Um, so he um, says, thank you for a fascinating analysis. Um, and asks, I wondered if this sequence has developed differently at all in social groups or countries where the family structure is more extended and less and nuclear. Um, so who would like to take that? Do you, do, you to, do you want to start, Claudia, and then maybe other people can say if they've got anything to add? Yeah, well, it, I, I think it depends upon whether Patrick's question is within the realm that I'm looking at or whether we're looking at economies in which uh, are making a move out of agriculture, whether we're looking at economies today or economies in the past. It's, it's sort of uh, quite open, uh, but I, I think that the, that the heart of the question is really about whether uh, grandparents step into the, the picture. And by and large, if you're living with your in-laws, the what you gain by them stepping into the picture is what you lose by the fact that you're the person who's also cleaning the house and working there. And we're also then thinking about a level of economic development, which is very different from the level that each of us has talked about in our, in our comments. I see Jane would like to jump in. 
Well, I, I just wanted to emphasize that, that grandparent care, even if you don't share a household, has really been very significant in European countries um, in, in uh, just before COVID, in your group five before COVID. And I think grandparents have played a key role in enabling women to have careers and families. But even more important, grandparents enable women to work, those poorer women who need, as I talked about, much more uh, wraparound care, much less uh, care that can be purchased from um, the childcare sector. So I do think grandparents really have a, a key role in this evolution um, of women's position. And, and the, the current- yeah, but, but let, let me add something about uh, my work on women working longer, because remember every grandmother is a woman as well. Yeah. And so in fact, in the US, uh, the largest increase in female labor force participation is women over the age of 55. And that's mainly because those are the women from group four, for example, who are older, who themselves have careers. This is exactly uh, what we were talking about with regard to cohort change. This is a cohort moving through time. They don't wanna take care of their grandchildren. <laughs> there, They have their own careers. Mm. Thank you. There's a there's a question here which I think um, picks up on uh, potentially on 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 um, on Berkai's point as well. So um, uh, this is from a third year economics and finance student from Surrey, um, asking how significant do you think gender inequality within parents, uh, specifically the amount of time spent with a child, is on children's development? So I don't know whether. I I think that the the questions that Berkay raised on uh, intensive parenting are absolutely fascinating. And that's like a whole other issue because we know that the more educated parents, not just in the US and in the UK, but in every country that's been, that we can study, that these are the parents that are putting in the greatest amount of time. And of course it's um, somewhat odd because it, the, it's the most expensive time. Uh, what exactly the results are from that is very hard to piece out because not only are the parents putting in time, but they're buying lots of things. So, uh, Berke, do you have an, uh, an addition here? Well, yes, actually, my co-author with Amara Lani from Cornell and I have been working on a project that to look at what type of investments are actually genders. So we can look at in the U.S. using NSY data whether it's long breastfeeding is, for example, can only be done by women, but then reading for the book can be done both men and women, but they are still done by women. So we do, we can classify a bunch of representative proxies about this parental investment strategies that are gendered themselves. And we see them that they are dramatically high and then they have long lasting effects in their like women's labor supply for the college educated women more so than the rest of the distribution. So. Yeah, I think this is yeah, but it, but in the ATUS, um, we we see that both educated men and educated women are spending over for the past 20, 30 years have progressively increased this intensive parenting. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's an interesting. Yeah, I think the question was specifically about child development, but I guess that's um partly. Um, what Berkeley's answer um, leads to this issue about uh, socialization as well that um, Jane mentioned. But I, I, I will move on. There's a short question here about um, from, from an academics perspective. So um, this is from Kitty Stewart and she's um, here at the LSE and she's saying academic jobs seem increasingly greedy. Uh, any thoughts from the panel on what we can do about this? So does anybody want to pick up on that? Well, I, th I think the question is about uh, up or out jobs, period. So, so greediness is not just the number of hours, it's also which hours and which hours are not just which hours in your day or in your week, but, but also in your life. So in some ironic sense, academic jobs are among the most flexible in the sense that you don't generally have to be around all the time or have FaceTime 
the way you do in finance jobs. And yet they're also extremely greedy in the sense that they're pulling at the hours at the start of your career. And that start of your career is now later and later. So it bumps up to uh, the biological clock issues. Whether or not anyone on the panel wants to call for the end of tenure, you know, we in the US have, uh, have a very strict, strong tenure progression. Uh, and also there is making partner in firms. And, and by the way, there's a wonderful piece out of Sweden that shows that first promotion matters a tremendous amount, even in the absence of formal partnerships and tenure. So, um, so I think that that is um, a, 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 a real issue. I'm not, I'm not certain how to get around it. Anyone want to get rid of tenure? <laughs> Sorry, Eva, do you want to get rid of tenure? Becca? Okay. Well, it's a bit disingenuous for me to say when I have it, uh, <laughs> so to get, not get rid of it. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I should say that um, um, academic jobs, like I fully agree with Professor Golden that academic jobs have these other benefits that, um, like it, it's in the book, which is quite well explained, an up and out type of jobs, um, and academic jobs fit into that characteristics. But we do have other benefits and flexibility that that are happening. One thing that I have I can say from my short exposure is this is not a new phenomenon that they are getting increasingly greedy. They are getting greedy in different ways, but they have been always greedy for the last at least 30, 40 years in general, as uh, like as, as much as we can see. Because yeah, and another interesting point, and there's a great paper on this, is that at least American universities and colleges went whole hog in having gender equity. And so if female faculty got time off, male faculty got time off, and surprise, surprise, the guys published papers and the women took care of the babies. So the policy issues <clears throat> are, I think, extremely difficult. I, I would say that we should, <clears throat> if we have tenure, we should try to do it early for everybody and not, and not drag this thing out longer and longer. Yes. So we now have a, a question from um, Maria uh, Letizia from Lund University. Um, and this is for Eva. So um, um, Maria uh, Letizia asks, the top 1% of income earners are mostly male. While progressive taxation is a tool to improve equality overall, would it affect women differently if they are just currently reaching high hierarchical roles within firms and at the same time earning higher wages? I think that's picking up on your point about taxation. So if you've got anything to say that about that, Eva? Right. Thank you. Um, I actually don't really know how many women versus men are in uh, top 1% of the income share. Um, I really put that question because uh, I think to be able to solve a particular problem, we need to be also understanding what is kind of driving that problem. And I thought that w whether that's um, the, right, the cuts in top tax income rates, I think it's important to understand whether that has to some extent uh, driven uh, the increase in the value of greedy jobs. But presumably if there are indeed mostly men who are top earners, by increasing top tax rates again, would, I guess, for sure reduce overall, total, overall income inequality, but also gender uh, income inequality. I don't know, this is just from top of my head, but I don't know what I, other- I, I think it's really far more difficult because when you increase top tax rates, you, you could also, the question is whether you're looking at after tax income, we're, we're always looking at pre-tax income and if you increase tax rates, uh, we saw this for CEOs 
in U.S. data, then you're you're increasing the amount that they receive, so that their after-tax earnings are actually higher. So I, I don't think this is a simple uh, question, but I do think, and I thank Eva for bringing up taxes, and I was hoping she would do that because if I were to criticize my own book, and I'm pretty good at criticizing it, uh, I would say that that I left out the tax angle. And then in the US, for example, where we still have joint taxation, it's a, it's a, 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 it, it is generally, for, for all the reasons we've been discussing, a greater tax on women. So, so therefore, we, we not only have joint taxation, but we don't have generous uh, child uh, care in terms of subsidies. And so therefore, the marginal hour for a woman to work, she's getting taxed at the marginal rate. And then, then she's, the family is paying for the care of the kids. So it's in fact leading to a reduction in the uh, number of hours the, uh, in the intensive margin or the extensive margin in terms of participation. So taxes are, are extremely important. And uh, if I rewrote the book, I would, I would add something on the fiscal policy side. So can I tag along one quick question about the taxes here? So the joint taxation has also implications about who marries and who stay cohabiting among the higher income earners. Is that correct? Uh, I remember one interview with two economists, Justin Walters and Betsy Stevenson. They were talking about not being married because of the tax policy reasons in one of the interviews. And so because the book gives a lot of emphasis on uh, marriage as well in the United States, who gets married. So there might be some angle to, to exploit a bit more about the taxation. Yeah, some... but I don't care if you get married or you don't get married. So Bessie and Justin would be in my book because they're, they cohabit and they have kids. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question, um, it's, I'm not quite sure who is the best one for, um, for because um, obviously you were talking about having having children and career, um, but uh, this is from Martina Scapin, um, who's an alumna from politics and communication. And um, Martina was curious to know how the declining birth rate um, in Western countries could contribute to a more equitable workplace for women as governments, for women as governments try to not very successfully encourage reproduction. Um, she adds, childcare remains extremely expensive in most countries. Um, I wonder why so many governments fail to tackle this very point uh, when it seems that this would make the biggest difference to women being able to continue their career without setbacks. So um, is this one for you, Jane? This is for Berkai, because this is really about demographics. Um... Okay. So Becca, you want to you want to try this one? You'll need to unmute if you're going to answer it. Um, it's not quite straightforward. So, <laughs> uh, um, so the um, no, obviously the demographic change was was something very much studied in the U.S. context that is also very U.S. specific in certain ways, and I do think that that's one thing that when we were reading the book from this side of the Atlantic, that some of the notions were not translating as, as clearly to, to our understanding here, if we are not familiar with the US context of family formation, family solution, and what families meant in terms of uh, across the income distribution, what they are. And so, yeah, I wouldn't dare to comment further on, on that at this stage. So. Yeah, I, I think the question is, what is the objective function? Right. So is the objective function to increase the birth rate or is the objective function to increase gender equity? You know, so I, I would just throw it out that way. And the policy would then depend upon whether you're trying to increase the birth rate, which lots of countries think they're, they're trying to do. At the same time, they want to increase gender equity. So so that that means that you you know have to have major uh, subsidies to child care. At the same time, you you don't want to have really you don't want to encourage very long 
parental leave and you want to have sort of shorter parental leave and at and yet at the same time you want also want to make certain that you get buy-in from the fathers so it's really those if if you have both want to have an objective function with increasing the birth rate and increasing gender equity you really have to do all of those you you have to get buy-in by fathers and you have to have enormous subsidies for child care. The, the US has big problems, okay? We have big problems. We're a huge country, okay? Take, take any country in Europe and you'll find a state in the United States with a population that's, that's equal or larger. We have just extreme diversity. In the US, it is the case that we are not, we are, we are not one nation and so, Having federal policy that essentially implies your children are my children and my children are your children and we're in an overlapping generations game is just is just not something that Americans are willing to buy into. May, maybe somewhat, a little bit more now, but we haven't done it. So one thing about these policies is also um, they all have distributional consequences and, and that they play out in an unexpected ways in terms of like future mobility, child poverty, or where in the distribution who gets the benefits and, and how does that translate into um, to the fertility or gender equity. So it's harder to think about them in the, in the right context. I mean, when we look at these parental enrollment policies like the Dakotas in that, in that literature that are in, implemented in a bunch of Scandinavian countries, continental European countries and Canada, like the findings are quite mixed in terms of its influences on enhancing gender equality within the family in terms of labor supply and so on. That some of them find very short-lived effects, some of them find long-term effects, some of them find an effect on the second birth. Some papers in some countries, they don't find these effects on the second birth, and then they find that increasing career attachment has a, has a negative effect on the birth rates. So it's very hard to generalize these, and I don't think that we need, I think we need more evidence to even understand which policies work with to which objective function that we talk about. Thank you. I'm, I'm aware of the time. Um, there's, only, there's only a minute or so left. Um, so I just wanted to give um, a chance for um, Claudia to provide any final words or anything you wanted to particularly respond to from uh, the questions and comments that were, were raised in this in this sort of final minute or minute and a half. Oh, Lucinda, thanks so much. Um, I think if I went to any of the separate issues such as the, the, the self-employment and the doctors, those doctors are not self-employed. <laughs> they, so self-employment is, is interesting and complicated and it's different if you have a lot of fixed costs versus you don't, but the, the physicians who are having the kids, they're not self-employed by, by and large. But so if I went into all the different issues, such as the fact that the MBA study actually does show that when men take off the same amount of time as women do, yes, yes, Jane, they have, they also, uh, it's also detrimental for them to about the same degree. So, but the point is that, that the questions that were raised by the three panelists show the, I think the fact that this is not an issue that goes away, that gender will always be with us and that gender is in some sense, the first great division in society and uh, let me end by saying that a question was raised about whether studying gender and economics was ever a problem. Not only was it, is it for me not a problem, but remember that almost every great labor economist, at least in the US, studied gender. Jacob Mincer <laughs> studied gender. Gary Becker studied gender. So every labor economist, unless they're only studying labor unions, is, is studying gender. Women are extremely interesting. It is the great first division in society and in the economy. 
So with that, I want to thank the three panelists and especially Lucinda for uh, managing us so very, very well. And I would like to thank the audience for being there and for asking incredibly good questions. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Jane, Berkai, and Eva. It's been great to have you today. And thank you all again to the audience.